Good early morning. The early bird gets the worm, and those who aren't here are going to really be missing some great demonstrations. So um, innovation, uh, as you all know, is a fundamental driver of progress that really does help improve quality of life for people. And uh, that's true across many fields, but none more so than with respect to medical technology, where advanced devices and diagnostics really allow people to live longer, healthier, and more productive lives. Over the past three decades, rapid technological advances have helped increase life expectancy by five years in the United States, and mortality rates for major diseases have significantly been reduced. Stroke by 59%, heart disease by 57%, and breast cancer by 31%. These advances also yield significant savings in the healthcare system by replacing more expensive procedures, avoiding hospital admissions and readmissions, and visits to emergency departments. What you're going to see today are two prime examples of medical technologies that are changing the healthcare paradigm. So first, the Amigo Suite, which was developed at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, is a $20 million operating room of a future equipped, uh, with future equipped MRI, CT scanners, and other technology that enables surgeons to scan a patient in real time without having to move them from the OR. The real-time 3D visuals, known as intraoperative imaging, help surgeons excise brain tumors and tissue with greater accuracy, reducing risks such as nick nerves from an errant knife and the potential need for repeat surgery. The images also help surgeons spot bleeding, blood clots, or other unexpected complications outside the field of vision. So now I'm going to uh, turn this over to the experts, um, led by uh, Nino Shioka, uh, who is um, the chairman of neurosurgery at the Brigham. And I will allow him to introduce his colleagues more fully, but Natalie Agar and Alex Golby uh, have joined him here on the stage. Nino? Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, you are hearty souls at 7 a.m. Actually, this is when we start brain surgery at the Brigham. And so, welcome to the operating room. Um, what we will do today is discuss a technology, really a set of technologies that involve intraoperative imaging. Uh, these technologies uh, were really invented and started at the Brigham in the early 1990s by a visionary neurosurgeon and neuroradiologist, Frank Jolas, who unfortunately passed um, uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, Frank has really transmitted then his legacy to our two uh, really brain behind the operation, Dr. Alexandra Golby and that are, Dr. Natalie Agar, who are here on the panel, and they will discuss the Amigo Suite. And so I will give uh, the podium to Dr. Alexandra Golby, who's an associate professor of neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to talk to you about Amigo today. We're gonna queue up a video that uh, shows what we do because I think this is a case where a video is worth about 10,000 words. So as soon as the video is queued up, uh, we can get started. So as Dr. Kioka said, the Amigo suite uh, was really the brainchild of Dr. Frank Yolez, who first had the vision in the 1990s of bringing MRI into the operating room to guide surgeons in their quest to remove brain tumors. The Amigo Suite is the next vision of that, which is the advanced multimodality image-guided OR. This is a three-room concept which puts all of contemporary imaging modalities into the reach of surgeons while they are still in the operating room with the patient. PET-CT is technology which uses metabolism for molecular imaging, which can guide the visualization of tumors which are otherwise not visible. Intraoperative MRI is here implemented as a three Tesla scanner with a 70 centimeter bore so that it can image uh, during surgery and it comes in on rails into the operating room. And then the middle room is where we do the bulk of our work for brain tumor resection it has this specially designed tables, as well as numerous other imaging modalities, such as the uh, fluoroscopy, ultrasound, 
and uh, navigation. So this is uh, used to guide resection of brain tumors. The biggest challenge in brain tumor surgery is to remove as much tumor as possible without injuring critical brain structures. And this is very challenging because it's not possible visually to differentiate those things. So we use navigation, which is like GPS for the head, and then we can contour various structures. In this case, we can contour the tumor itself and inject that as a heads-up display into the operating microscope. And you can appreciate how helpful that can be in distinguishing the different tissue as we're working. And then also bringing that into registration with the imaging, which is really how we decide what our surgical goal is. So during surgery, we use these methods to guide what we're doing. And then when things have changed quite a lot, as they do while we're taking the tumor out, we can get updated imaging. This is using ultrasound and registering it with the MRI, which is a very efficient way of getting an image. Uh, which we can do multiple times during the surgery. And then this is bringing the scanner into the room. It's a 10-ton machine that's kept at 4 degrees Kelvin, so moving it into the operating room is quite a feat. Uh, but it gives us this kind of resolution, so we can see intraoperatively and contour with the help of the radiologist an area of residual tumor that we would like to excise, and then fuse that with the navigation and return to surgery thereby removing the area of residual tumor. And during this uh, resection, we can also take multiple specimens of the lesion and localize where they were taken from using our tools, and then give them to our colleagues who are developing various biomarkers. So I'm gonna hand it over to Natalie. This is just an image which shows the complete brain tumor resection at the completion of the case. So for almost a decade now, our group has been investigating in the laboratory the potential of using mass spectrometry as a tool to distinguish tumor from a healthy tissue. But it's three years ago that our group has made the leap of integrating the mass spectrometer into the operating room, and more specifically into the Amigo uh, for its clinical validation. While our ultimate goal is to convert existing surgical tools to become sampling devices for the mass spectrometer, the core of our work has focused on validating the molecular information that comes from the mass spectrometer in distinguishing tissue using existing ambient ionization approaches. So using mass spectrometry now, we can actually detect very specific biomarker that, can, that correlate with the presence of cancer cells and can then for be used to guide uh, surgery to distinguish tumor from non-tumor. We can also use similar methodologies now to follow drug distribution in the tumor and into the brain anatomy and address limitations of the blood-brain barrier in treating patients. So while Dr. Gobi and I have the honor to introduce you to the Amigo, its creation and utilization are supported by multiple teams of physicians, scientists, nurses, technicians, coordinators, administrators, and funding entities dedicated to improve patient care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, if, if the audience has any questions, you can use uh, your tablets, and we will uh, uh, um, ask these questions to our panelists. But I will start off by uh, discussing this with Dr. Gobi. So, intraoperative imaging, intraoperative MRI, it was started here, you know, two decades ago, but now it is widely available. You can go to almost any major academic medical center most community advanced neuroscience centers will have some type of intraoperative imaging, either intraoperative MRI or intraoperative CT. So now this technology has been widely adopted throughout the United States and even throughout the world. The question for Dr. Gobi is, what is next? How can we, how are we gonna make this technology better? What else can we use this technology for in making our operations safer? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so. Our goal really is to harness the real-time feedback that we get from imaging. And there are a variety of ways in which uh, we're pushing the boundaries of that to the next level. One example is using uh, laser hyperthermia to destroy brain tumors uh, or epileptic foci. So this uses heat 
to destroy the tissue, and it depends uh, critically on real-time feedback of what's being destroyed, uh, because obviously in the brain we want to be very precise about what tissue uh, we injure, and that is afforded by uh, MR thermometry. So that's an example of using MR to give us a very different kind of intraoperative data, data that then allows us to uh, perform a much more minimally invasive approach. Uh, another example is in guiding the placement of electrodes for deep brain stimulation. Um, and this can be done actually in the bore of the magnet uh, using some uh, commercial devices that have been adapted to that purpose. And then finally, one of the most exciting ways in which MR can be used to guide brain surgery is in the delivery of drugs to the CNS. So as Natalie mentioned, uh, the blood-brain barrier is an important obstacle to the delivery of drugs. And a number of approaches have been used, uh, placement of catheters into the brain and delivery of drugs or other uh, therapeutics. Uh, actually, Dr. Kioka is going to be delivering a viral vector into the brain uh, for patients with brain tumors. Um, and also focused ultrasound, which is another MR-based technique which can be used to open the blood-brain barrier reversibly. So those are some of the most uh, exciting and novel things that we're working on. And then um, I think Natalie can talk about also the use of this technology as a platform for validation of tools which might actually be deployed much more broadly, so in sites that don't have intraoperative MRI. Yes, yeah, so the Amigo has been uh, critical for us in validating mass spectrometry and one first approach is one first approach, but we're also using different types of mass spectrometry to be able to detect very specific molecules. For, for the pituitary tumors, we're looking at proteins, which requires a different mass spectrometer than you've seen there. But together with Dr. Gobi, we're also evaluating the potential of using Raman uh, imaging to image tissue in real time at the molecular level and uh, even earlier stage development now is to use mid-IR absorption to provide histological information on the tissue at stake. So the, the goal there would be to have a tool that the surgeon can use um, in real time, even a handheld tool to distinguish a tumor from healthy brain or even to subtype the type of tumor or the cellular concentration as the resection is actually being done. That's great. Uh, there's a couple of questions from the audience from our Yorn account. Um, the first one is, do you need a metal-free operating room for the intraoperative MRI? So, uh, great question. The original double donut, uh, which was cited in the early 90s, the patient was placed in the middle of the magnet and the entire surgery took place in the magnet. And in that situation, everything had to be MR compatible. And so we actually developed here uh, a complete set of MR-compatible instruments, including power drill, microscope, everything. But the field has really moved since that time to using an in and out procedure. So either the patient can move on rails to the scanner, or in our case, the scanner moves into the operating room. And that has the beauty of allowing us to use any tools interoperatively. Uh, we can use the ultrasound, the microscope. We can do electrophysiology for brain mapping, which we actually use a lot. We use uh, continuous uh, sensory and motor evoked potentials. Um, and then when we're ready to image, we do a safety check. All the things that are not MR compatible are moved either out of the room or outside the five Gauss line. Um, and then we obtain the MR. The trade-off there is that getting an MRI scan takes much longer. In the old double donut, it could be done in about three minutes. Here it takes at least 10 times that long. But now that we have the other technologies, uh, the advanced navigation, the ultrasound, um, and some of the biomarkers, I think that that's a reasonable trade-off. And uh, there's another question that came up. There's a, actually a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. One is a combined question, which is, what makes the Amigo truly unique? You know, this technology now is available in multiple hospitals, similar type of technologies. Um, you know, how many other hospitals have this, and what, what's different from the one that we have here? So uh, about uh, 100 sites in the world have intraoperative MR. Uh, very, very few sites, only three or four, have high-field MR, which allows us to do much more sophisticated imaging, such as intraoperative diffusion tensor imaging to look for the white matter tracks. 
Uh, we're also the world's only intraoperative PET CT, and that really opens the door towards molecular imaging and using various tracers to localize the target tissue. Uh, Amigo is also unique in uh, involving much more than neurosurgery. So this is actually a multi-specialty OR, bringing these types of approaches to other uh, organs. So a lot of what we learned in the brain over the 20 years is being translated into other organs. And then really the most important thing, um, as with everything, is the team. So uh, it's actually not that hard to get an intraoperative MRI if you have money but it's uh, really hard to assemble the group of clinicians and scientists that we have at the Brigham. So there's um, a very deep bench. Over 100 people are involved in this uh, with technologies such as robotics, um, various imaging uh, sequences that have been developed, uh, the cyclotron and bringing all the nuclear medicine uh, into this, and then uh, bringing in sophisticated clinician champions to bring their ideas into the Amigo suite. That's one of the goals of the suite is to um, really engage the, com the clinical community in how they might use these tools. Uh, you talked about money mm -hmm. and you talked about $20 million. Oh. So it sounds like this technology impacts quality outcome, but how about cost savings? Uh, is there any benefits on throughput and does the cost really justify the end result here? So I. I I think the answer to that question is forthcoming. Um, since we are really a translational research test bed, uh, we have the luxury of kind of being at the forefront and designing the next generation treatments. I think if you have, for example, a patient who was inoperable become operable, um, if you have a maximally invasive surgery that becomes a minimally invasive surgery, there will be some savings realized. Um, in the very short term, uh, because we're doing so much research uh, in the suite, it's not um, optimized for clinical throughput. I have one more question for Dr. Agar, which is <coughs> she's able to look at metabolites. Yesterday we spoke about genotype of tumor cells. Well, genes are there to make things in cells, and one of the things they make are metabolites, which are sort of like the outcome of genetic function. And Dr. Agar is able to, at the single cell level or at the multicellular level, to measure these metabolites. Why is that important as you take out tumors? What, does, what is that going to help us do? Well, it's to be able to develop those tools like Dr. Golby um, alluded to that will be uh, cheaper and faster to really tell the surgeon what is the tissue that is at stake. Is this tumor, is this not tumor? and to integrate this in the surgical decision making. Uh, but there are no current ways to actually be able to tell if tissue is cancer or non-cancer in real time. And so I think this is the key issue. Yeah. This is in real time being able to tell within seconds if whether a tissue is cancerous or not cancerous. Um, and I think this is the key of this technology. So I think we're out of our time. Uh, we have the yellow screen, and it's time for us to pass this on to the next technology. Uh, we thank you very much for your attention. Quite remarkable. You know, Dr. Golby and I were chatting for a little bit before we got started just about the uh, benefits of having the integration between the acute phase in neurosurgery and rehabilitation. And I, I would say that um, with this kind of technology, there's clearly a lot of instances in which the need for physical rehabilitation is obviated altogether, or though even when it's necessary, bodes well for a much better outcome. So this is uh, this is tremendous advance. And next, you will see another uh, demonstration of the uh, neuro switch for use with patients who are suffering from locked-in syndrome, or LIS, um, in which a person is uh, completely paralyzed of all voluntary movements, typically except for movements of the eyes, uh, vertical gaze and eyelid opening uh, being uh, the functional capabilities. In classical LIS, unlike coma or vegetative state, uh, individuals are conscious, alert, and awake. 
Um, and there's often no impairment of receptive language, memory, and intellectual functions. Movements um, uh, is with, spe with respect to expressive speech are lost, but communication may be possible through the eye movements and blinking. So ALS is one of the diagnoses that's an example of a, it's a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord, and many ALS patients um, uh, become locked in. So the neuro switch uses EMG signals from a person's skeletal muscle, even if it's functionally disabled, allowing them to use their own computer and generate speech. NeuroSwitch uses pattern recognition to constantly adapt to a person's state from relatively alert to severely fatigued and accommodates for random events such as twitching and the involuntary muscle fibers and spasticity. It's another example of medical technology at its best. And I'm going to turn this over now to uh, Dr. Merit Sakovich, who is uh, chair of neurology at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and she will introduce her colleague, Peter Ford. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about how technology can really improve the lives of our patients with ALS and other neurological illnesses. I want to introduce uh, Peter Ford, who's CEO of Control Bionics, and is going to be really demonstrating some of the technology his company has made to help patients communicate better with uh, ALS. Uh, later uh, this morning, you'll, you'll meet uh, two patients who have really uh, um, volunteered to come here and to show you how they use NeuroSwitch, uh, Brandy Gordine and Bobby Forster. I want to thank them for coming and, um, and showing you uh, how they use this device and their thoughts about communication. And please, if you have questions for them or for us uh, to use the, the Yorn. Um, so yesterday we, we spoke a lot about the science and the excitement in neurodegeneration, in particular ALS, and, and trying to find, to understand the disease, find ways to um, you know, stop the illness and prevent it. Um, today we're really going to focus on how technology can help improve the lives of, of patients living with ALS today. Uh, it's considered a rare disease, um, but it really depends on how you look at the numbers. In, in the United States, there's about 35,000 people living with uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and about 5,000 new diagnoses every year. It's also been found to be more common in, in our veterans, and that really crosses uh, many wars, from the more recent ones to, to the World War II and the Korean War. Uh, it's about twofold increased risk in our veterans, and there's about 3,000 veterans now living with ALS in the United States. Um, but if one looks at the lifetime risk of ALS, it's actually um, pretty, pretty frightening, it's pretty high, uh, one in 300 males. Um, will develop ALS in about 1 in 800 uh, females. So it's an illness that gets more common as people age, uh, but, but can be seen in people as young as the 20s and as old as in their 90s. Um, people are living with ALS a lot longer now, uh, and that's in large part due to uh, improved care of the patients as well as, as technology that can help patients uh, in, in their community. And one of the things we, we hear most from our patients is the importance of communication. This is really about their relationships with their friends and their families, their children, and the, and, and the ability to really communicate. And the devices out there really until recently have not been you know, helpful enough. There are things uh, where people can use their eyes or writing. But with ALS, uh, every patient's different, and which muscles available uh, to use for communication is different. So having a system that can adapt with the patients is really, really important. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn uh, to um, Peter Ford to tell you a little bit about um, the device that he's developed. Thanks, Dr. Sikovich. Um, one of the things that we've looked at here for uh, assistive technology is to get past the physical interface with things like switches, uh, sip and puff straws, things where you have to focus on something or, or concentrate on making uh, a signal physically and then having that translated into a communication signal with a computer. So what we chose to do was to patch straight into the body's own neuroelectric system by using EMG sensors. And if you have a look at the computer screen now, you'll see uh, a classic um, standard EMG uh, electrode set, those three electrodes down in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, they're clinically approved uh, standard EMG or uh, EKG sensors that you'll find in pretty much any hospital. And instead of using those to monitor the muscle, we figured if a client could, or a patient, could control in any way the signal going to any muscle anywhere on their body, even if that muscle was substantially uh, dysfunctional and 
all the other uh, skeletal muscles in their body were not responding optimally, we thought if they could con just control that signal, even with a signal that's not powerful enough to make the muscle, for example, flex, we could use that signal, tap it, and get that to control a computer. So what we did was, um, what we did was, we picked that signal up, and you'll see in the top left-hand corner on the screen, there's a, a, a monitor. This is a, a symbolic illustration of what happens when the signals travel into the motor end plate of the muscle, creates a potential drop along the muscle, and we picked that up. That's the EMG data, and this is how it's displayed. But we figured also we couldn't just have a person make a signal to a certain strength to create an on switch um, any time because so many of these conditions involve changes in muscle state or signal state, fasciculation, spasticity, um, all kinds of random events. So instead we patched it into a scanning technology where the computer uh, actually puts up a series of choices on the screen and when the person sees the choice that they want, they go to that and the computer makes the change for them. So on this, on this next uh, clip you're going to see, you'll see that once the signal starts running uh, in the top left-hand corner, if you make an on switch, it launches a, a scanning keyboard. And the computer gives you choices down each row on that keyboard. So the person simply waits until it gets to the choice they want, then they make an on switch or a muscle flex, and that gets the computer to stop on that row and then go across from left to right to the target button. In this case, these buttons can print text, they can launch programs, they can drive uh, mechanical devices, they can turn lights on and off. So a person who can only do one single thing and send one signal, uh, neural, neural signal to a muscle site can actually start taking over all kinds of functions. Not least of all, if we have sound Hello. up on this, How are you? Um, I don't know if you can just hear that, but we get text on screen and text to speech. It can be preset like this on a button, or it can be um, done key by key. And on the top right hand corner, you'll see a word prediction uh, screen, which works the same as a word prediction on your telephones. And between those two functions, a person who can only send a, a variable signal to a muscle site. Uh, can then control all these functions on a computer. Everything that can be controlled with a keyboard and mouse can be controlled with this system, with NeuroSwitch. I'd like to um, ask Brandy Grandin to come up and show us how this works on site, but um, just while we're doing that, I'd like to show you a video of um, a family in Sydney, Australia, uh, the Sargoods. And uh, Glenn Sargood was diagnosed with ALS about three years ago. He has uh, quadriplegia and loss of speech. And what we found was when people could start communicating with it, it not only changed their lives. As Dr. Sakovich says, one of the most important things for somebody who has a diagnosis like this, whether it's ALS or spinal cord injury, any of a number of other issues which impact on the, on the neuromuscular system, the most important thing that comes to light is communication. And it's the most human thing. We're using really seriously high technology to do a most fundamental thing, to allow humans to be able to relate to the rest of the world. Uh, otherwise, you're isolated. And this enables you to, again, make contact and, and create these communications. Um, so this is the impact it has, not just on Glenn, just but also on his family. Face-to-face -face communication, it's all those other aspects of communication. He can go into iTunes and download music, download TV shows, download movies. And speak to the most important people in his life, his three kids. What do you think about that? Awesome. Oh, that's cool. It's really important to like talk to Dad because if he didn't like have the neuro switch, then he probably like couldn't talk to us. Communicating with my kids means more than words. I was locked out from so many things I had previously taken for granted. This has given me back independence and freedom. So uh, that video is actually the rest of the tape. You're now looking at my computer screen. But um, the cool thing about the communication for the family is that once again, a father can talk to his son, a wife can talk to her husband. That really vital communication, not just with a person in the world, but with people around them, is, is the core. But also with this and going online, they can reach out to the rest of the world. So we're just going to go and, and link you now into Brandy Grondine's computer. She's uh, assumed or, um, got her first neuro switch here through Mass General uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and this is her husband, George. And we're just going to link up with this 812, 125. 
0.264. So what we're going to do is um, we want to show you how NeuroSwitch works independently uh, with Bluetooth. And Brandy has uh, the same sort of sensors you saw on her left frontalis on, the, on her forehead. And it means then with, with a very minimal eyebrow twitch, um, you can create the kind of switching you saw. And the computer doesn't just look at the magnitude of the switch, it actually looks at the pattern to, to determine the intention of the person. So it filters out things like spasticity or fasciculation. And it's going into a little uh, blue box that Brandy has here, and I have another one just here, called a neuroeducator. And this is the grandson of a, of a clinical EMG device. Um, a lot of you in neuro, any kind of neurosciences may have run across something like this. It's a straight EMG sensor. It feeds out at a very high rate, and uh, it Bluetooths now into the control computer. And, and what we're going to do is run, Brandy's going to control this computer with NeuroSwitch, with signal from a frontalis. And we're going to put this up on screen for you, on screen share, because we're also uh, Bluetoothing into here. So what you see is going to come through my computer, but it's being generated by Brandy's. We just want to show you how it works wirelessly. Yep. Thank you for coming, and, and just to give a little bit um, about no your worries. story uh, to the crowd. As Brandy said, her, her story is an op open book. Um, uh, Brandy's had symptoms of uh, motor neuron disease since 2004. It's a, um, uh, a variant of motor neuron disease called uh, HSP, um, and um, she just started, uh, as Peter mentioned, started using NeuroSwitch two weeks ago. I don't know if you want to add any comments about how that, that's been going. Um. I am sort of on the line of still being able to use a keyboard and a mouse with my PC, but I am unemployed and I spend my time online talking to people. And I am a book blogger. <laughs> and having a hard time typing and using the mouse is limited what I can write and who I can talk to. So when I was offered this opportunity, I was super excited to take advantage of it, hoping it could get me back to regularly reviewing and talking about Buck. So if you make a signal now, can you get a, uh, can you get a scan going? Just let me check to see if we're online. So if you can see on the screen here, on the top left-hand corner next to the black apple, you can see NeuroSwitch is launching. And when it comes up, on the bottom right-hand corner, you see the scanning unit and the demo gods uh, telling us we're not getting a match, so we'll get that back in a second. Hmm. So. NeuroSwitch, first of all, links on by Bluetooth into the computer. And once we get a link, the program then talks to the scanning technology. And it will start scanning uh, in a minute. So. If this doesn't come up straight away, we're, I'm going to go on to my system. We'll uh, switch Brandy over to this one. I was still breathing earlier, so. Yeah, it worked perfectly last night. I mean, no conference is complete yeah, <laughs> without messing around with the video, right? Exactly. So. It's true. Exactly. We've even got our ponytailed <laughs> programmer. <laughs> so this is really easy to set up. 
Um, so Brandy's online now. So if you make a signal now, you should get a scan. There you go. And, and one of the things that, what, what really fascinated me about you when we first met was that uh, you review romantic novels. I do. And you have a blog where you write that, those uh, reviews. Yeah. <clears throat> Excellent. And so, and, and you were saying that you are starting to find it difficult to use the keyboard and mouse. Correct. Right. So how was it, how long did it take you, um, despite what you've just seen with the switching up, how long did it take you to actually get started on NeuroSwitch? Um, you know, but if we got past the uh, um, basically finding a good spot for the sensor, I mean, immediately I could write by that. So lovely, but I mean it's Could I just put the cable back behind your ear here? Is it more comfortable? Yeah. Oh. Thanks. Um, what was the first thing you typed? I opened up like whatever Max version of Notepad and I typed the quick brown fox comes over <laughs> the lazy dog. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's a good test of the typist as well as the machine. That's excellent. <clears throat> so um, we'll, be able, we'll be able to see uh, more reviews of romantic novels coming Hopefully. up soon. Yeah, through NeuroSwitch. Um, how's, the, uh, how's the learning curve? Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, for what it is, which is a radical change in how I use the computer. Is, uh, what's the stress like? Or what's the work level like when you go from the keyboard and mouse and switch on to a neural interface? I mean, it, it takes me twice as long to do anything, but is it, I is mean, it more tiring or less? No, it is less tiring. But like when you think about it, it takes a while to first learn how to type. That's true. Anyway, so I'm getting faster and more comfortable. And I'm not flinging myself forward and my arms up on the keyboard. Which is what you were doing when you were using a physical keyboard and mouse. Yep. Well, I um, thank you very much. This, um, and There's one question. Yeah. There's one question for the audience for you, Brandy, <coughs> which was, uh, uh, they, can you point us to your web blog? I think people want to follow you. Cool. <laughs> uh, well, hey. Is there and a URL? Uh, yeah, it's a tab. Uh, can we Google uh, a Brandy Grundy? Well, the blog I am part of is called Love in the Margin. Love in the Love Margin. Love in the Margin. All right. Cool. Because we review romance novel right. featuring marginalized characters. Oh, cool. So I'm the token cripple. But, but I understand these are really <laughs> racy books. Well, some of them. They're not, they're cool. not all. So, uh, good. So, so this, should, this should open up the avenues to get back into that and let us all share it with you. God, I hope so. <laughs> Brandy, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Bobby Foster, and uh, George is coming up to escort Brandy off. And Bobby's coming up with his fiance, Casey. I have one more question. Thank you. And thank Just, you, Brandy. Thank you, Dan. Um, uh, Peter, while we're waiting, there is a, a question for you as well, um, which is, can multiple muscle groups be used for second input, uh, for two-axis input and faster typing? You didn't need to. OK. Um, yes. Uh, that's a very good question. What, when, I, when we first started designing this, and, and we actually started the technology, the, the, the nexus, oh, sorry, the uh, genesis of it started in a research and development lab in Atlanta about 35 years ago. 
And um, I was doing something totally different. Uh, I was a news anchor at CNN in the brand new network, which was revolutionizing communication. And Dr. Lynn Drake um, suggested that I talk to some people at Georgia Tech, and we started uh, working in this uh, R&D lab. And right at the beginning, uh, I wanted to find a way to communicate for the person at the end of the tunnel. Because we had a, a large number of people coming into the rehab lab who had um, certain levels of disability. But I was thinking about, I was actually inspired by Professor Hawking. I was thinking about the guy who couldn't do anything but had significant things to say and do, um, not just at genius level, but at basic human level. And so I thought, if they can only do one thing, let's tap into that. So this, to come back along by a long route to your question, is it works on one channel. With one channel, you can do everything you could normally do with a keyboard and mouse. But it's a very good question because if you have multiple inputs, you not only get double the effect, you get a synergistic effect. So instead of having two, uh, on, on off here on the left side, on off here on the right side, you also get, if you could do it in a binary way, on off, on off, on on, off off, and you get the combination. So you get a permutation rather than uh, just a combination. So when we go to multiple switches, um, we can do so much more. And in that area, we're all already looking going into telerobotics um, and much more complex control systems. Some of the things that, that uh, Dr. Ling referred to yesterday uh, in, the DARPA, in his DARPA commentary. So um, we're restricted right now. We're staying right now with one channel because we want to get to everybody right now who's out of reach of regular AT. But the obvious um, next development of that is to bring on all the other channels. And one of the units I have here is a four-channel unit which we're already coding to. So. For that question, I hope that answers the question and gives you some idea of where we're pushing on beyond that. <clears throat> Bobby's got um, a number of things to do here, and I think the, Dr. Sakovich could um, describe uh, Bobby's diagnosis. And we good to go? Yeah, I just changed that to 30 microvolts. Fantastic. And um, if you could describe yeah, so thank you, uh, Bobby's Bobby situation. Thank you, Bobby, for joining us. Um, no problem. Um, Thanks for having me. Uh, that's great. So Bobby uh, has been has symptoms for about a year now, uh, diagnosed with ALS uh, la last summer, yeah. and uh, has been also just recently started using uh, NeuroSwitch. Yeah, about two weeks ago. Yeah. And, uh, so how do you like it? I love it. It's, uh, did, did we pay you to say that? No, no, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you can if you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that runs into the ethics commentary. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Um, so for myself, I, I have had symptoms for about a year now and over the last couple months, um, as you can see, my hands are, you know, really starting to go. So typing has been, you know, something that's been more difficult for me. Um, I'm still working at this point, uh, working four days a week and I, I primarily work uh, on my computer and via the phone. So this has been a great tool for me. Uh, you know, moving forward, and you know, as I as my disease progresses, I'm progressing on this uh, on this keyboard. I'm actually getting pretty quick with it. A number of people we talk to, a number of clients we talk to, wait uh, until their symptoms develop significantly before they decide whether or not to go to this kind of AT. Um, do you have any comments now that you've experienced this in the early stages about early adoption? Uh, I think it's huge. <laughs> I think it makes a, a really big difference. Um, you know, there is a little bit of a learning curve on this, though it's, it's pretty intuitive. Um, getting the speed up and, you know, being very proficient at typing takes some time. So, uh, you know, over the course of the last two weeks once I've had this, I, I've upped the speed multiple times and I, I envision myself in, you know, another, another month or two to be, you know, Pretty, pretty quick on That's this. That's fantastic. So you, be, you, you seem to be using word, rec uh, sorry, word um, prediction, uh, able to type as fast as an average, an average typist. Yeah, I get there. Um, how, fast did it, how fast were you able to actually figure out how it worked, get the original? Um, uh, so I, I was doing the trial with Peter, and he was explaining it. And um, you know, about five minutes into it, I was like, OK, I see how this works. And he's, he's telling me steps, and I'm you know, already oh, yeah. ahead of him. <laughs> so it was kind of nice. <laughs> Now, there are a couple of things that you're, you're planning really well uh, yeah. with this, and, and there are a couple of things that you're planning for downstream. You have not one, but three 3D printers. Yeah. What's your major project for that? Um, so 3D printing was kind of a hobby for me uh, prior to my diagnosis. Um, it was something that just kind of intrigued me. Uh, I've always liked building stuff and tinkering with stuff. Um, since my diagnosis, I've just made a bunch of adaptive devices. Um, 
from stuff that a little bracket that goes around my wrist that allows me to carry uh, grocery bags in or my laundry downstairs uh, to stuff to help me with bathing um, and putting on deodorant and you know just things that you kind of take for granted um, and as you know, I've gone on throughout this process, I am working to uh, 3D print robotic arms that I can control via the NeuroSwitch or you know, really any computer interface, but uh, the NeuroSwitch is giving me the access to be able to control the computer, uh, which allows me to control the robotic arms. Fantastic, and we just happen to have a robotic arm. In we sure do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's really cool about this is, is Bobby's being really proactive and uh, 3D printing, as you know, is a is a still a revolutionary new technology, but um, and and being able to develop more and in, more intricate and more uh, dexterous uh, robotic arms is going to be a huge factor. In fact, one of the things that um, when we talk about this with uh, with people with uh, uh, disabilities is, what would you like to do? And very often people just say, I want to scratch my nose. All these things, as Bobby said, we take for granted, uh, become really important. So those of you who are like us geeks um, will recognize this is actually a hobby um, arm. You can buy it for about 70 bucks at a store, but it does demonstrate the principle of what Bobby can do with it. And uh, are we patched up? Yeah, I think so. We'll find out in a second. So if we get a shot of the arm, um, yeah. Yeah. just to also impress a couple of things with you, uh, your, your Bluetooth team with us, the right. same unit here. So it's talking with Bluetooth to the computer. The computer is there's no wires attached to it, and so it's it's everything's wireless, which means you can move it around. You can use it sitting up, lying down. You can use it in a chair. You can use it. You can actually use it in the bath, provided you don't get the sensors wet. So, um, what Bobby's doing now is controlling this by linking into the robotics computer, and let's see how it goes. All right. One sec. Ah. There we go. There we don't go. Um, oh, yep. Yeah, I'm clicked on it. It says it's clicking. That, yeah. Oh, that should. Uh, is it switched on? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> so, the really cool thing about the technology is you got to switch it on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter helped me code a board specific for the robotic arm. Yeah. Oh, just click on that. There we go. As you can there see, you it's moving. Wow. So that movement is, um, it's like one small step. And that movement, the first millimeter, opens up so many other avenues. This arm, as you know, is a toy. But it does all the things that, that a highly dexterous arm uh, can do, i.e., it will take instructions from a controller and turn it into all kinds of really useful functions, from scratching your nose to passing food, uh, glass of water, um, to actually physically doing things, moving things around on a tabletop. So with this system now, just using that one EMG input that we started with, you can reach out, talk to people, you can email, you can go on the internet, you can um, start moving arms. We have uh, clients who are patched into telepresence robots at AnyBot in uh, Silicon Valley. They actually take the bots out on the floor and drive them around. And it gives you an enormous sense of reaching out again um, and, and overcoming those things which you were told you couldn't do anymore. Yeah. And, um, and the, the basic element of that is um, it distilled by one of our clients who said, when I use this, when I'm out on the internet, when I'm on Twitter, people see me. They don't see disability. They don't see anything else. They see me. And that's one of the key elements of being able to provide good communication. Yeah. So Bobby, good luck with this. We're actually looking forward to working with Bobby. With uh, He's going to print some components for the arm and also for NeuroSwitch. So we're looking at a strategic alliance with him uh, as he builds his skill set with NeuroSwitch. And we think that um, this also opens up opportunities for anybody with disabilities who can start reassessing the fact that if they have a skill set or a knowledge base, there's no longer anything stopping them reaching out with telepresence, with the internet, being able to do so many things that they were told they couldn't. This is opening up so many doors that people thought were closed. And Bobby, thank you very much. No and we're problem. looking forward to working with you over yeah. the next few years. Likewise. <laughs> thank you very much, Bobby. There's 
There's one last thing I'd like to show you, and it goes to the heart of the technology. But um, while I'm setting that up, uh, Dr. Sakovich, did you get any more questions? There's one more question. Besides training and improvement at the patient level, is there training at the software level? using statistics of the patient's muscle twitches? For ah, that's a very good question. One of, the, one of the primary places we do that straight away is um, on um, a, a piece of technology that's already built into it. That keyboard you see scanning, or you did see scanning, that's built by assistive wear in Amsterdam. And it's considered the leading uh, 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 scanning technology on the planet. They also have that predictive keyboard. And like the one on your phone, it actually starts to remember your favorite words. So in, in a way, that's, there's already a learning process built into the ancillary part of it. As far as NeuroSwitch is concerned, um, it's, uh, it, it doesn't have memory, but it adapts to the patterns of a person's behavior. So with very little um, uh, adjustment, for example, the speed at which people want to make a, si a signal and the level at which they want to be able to make the signal with, where they can make minor movements without actually interfacing with the computer, those are basic adjustments we can do physically, and once they're set, they're set for the person. They're, they're uh, personalized. The really important thing is, if it changes, we can come online with them with telepresence, and in real time, uh, from anywhere on the planet, w only with their commission, uh, permission, we're not the NSA, but with their permission, we can come into their computer and work with them to upgrade technology, to check systems on, on their computer and in their hardware, in their uh, neuroeducator, and also to customize new keyboards. So, um, with Bobby and Brandy both, uh, we've done sessions online. Uh, Bobby and, and Brandy's husband, George, are very good programmers themselves, so they're already developing their own permutations with this. So in that way, there is a learning process, and, and it's a continuing one. Also, we upgrade at, very, at regular intervals, and, it, and the upgrades are free th through life. Um, it's one of, the, one of the important parts of the support because it's an ongoing system. It evolves with the user. The last thing I'd like to show you is um, a video that uh, we just got from Sydney, Australia. And there's a family over there whose father has uh, ALS. He has uh, quadriplegia and loss of speech. And he, um, uh, he's been communicating with Neuroswitch for about three months. And he has a son who's seven years old. And when his son comes home from school in the afternoon, uh, like a lot of households around the world, uh, he sits next to his dad and talks about the day. And his dad asks him questions using NeuroSwitch and a generated voice. And the son normally would respond verbally. But in this case, and this is a really nice example of the way um, people innovate in ways we don't expect, um, the son uh, actually communicates with his dad by uh, tapping on his electrodes and actually using the neuroswitch to answer his dad. So you're going to see, I'm, I'm going to talk you through this. Um, we have three minutes left and we have plenty of time. You're going to see uh, the dad uh, talking to the son using neuroswitch with a voice generator, just as you've seen here. And you're going to see the son, seven years old, reaching over and the sensor's on his dad's left arm and he's tapping the sensor. Now, for fellow geeks in the audience, he's not actually creating a signal through the muscle. That's obviously uh, not practical. He's interfering with the um, field, the surface field between the two white electrodes, the active sensors. So that's how he's inter interfacing with NeuroSwitch. But he's tapping out the messages on his dad's screen and answering him with NeuroSwitch and the voice generator. So it's really sweet. But also, you know, seven-year-olds being uh, pretty devious, uh, he figures once he gets on the right side of dad, after he comes home from school, he's asked, mom if he could have some potato chips and mama said no so what do kids do <laughs> so let's have a look at this and um, so this is this is his dad his name is Matthew lovely family uh, working on NeuroSwitch and generating it and and his son has figured out if he taps on the sensors he can get an answer and I hope we got uh, can get good sound up on this So he's asking about his soccer game. And the son is generating a an answer saying how much he kicked the ball today. And then he has a question at the end. Listen carefully. Soccer was good. It was fun. I kicked the ball too many times. I lost count. <laughs> May I have some chips, please, Dad? May I have some chips, please, Dad? Yes. 
<laughs> yeah. One of the things we've, we want to do with this technology, as you've seen in this entire amazing forum, uh, this, is a, this is a wonderful new um, precedent, this forum. One of the things we're seeing is how really advanced human technology is working in the most amazing ways to revolutionize the way humans can be healed, treated, and now communicate. But the essence is a very human thing that we all share, no matter what our background, gender, race, age, creed, or anything is. Each of us humans during this short mortal period wants to do one thing that we all share, and that is to say to the world, that other seven billion people on this planet we share, to say to the world, I am here and I matter. And being able to communicate under the most difficult circumstances is one of the most profound, essential, and rewarding things any of us humans can do. So it's been a real privilege to be able to work in this area of technology and help promote this. And we intend to continue doing this as far as we can push the technology. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a spe uh, another special thanks to Peter and to Brandy and Bobby for showing us the demonstration. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.